Okay. <laughs> so we haven't spoken about Russia for uh, some time and in detail, there's a lot going on. We had the, the Wagner rebellion that uh, failed. We have the counteroffensive from Ukraine st building up slowly, but certainly not pushing uh, uh, Russia towards peace talks. And th there was uh, a number of articles out that uh, Russia very effectively mined a massive amount of uh, the country in a way that will make it very difficult for an aggressive advance going forward. So this could drag the war out on for some time. And as a result, the uh, character of the war has changed and gotten much more violent and, uh, and increased the risk of black swan events coming out of it. And now because of uh, the Wagner Group and what's gone on there, you're starting to see questions about uh, Mr. Putin's position in, in the nation. So uh, really interesting time and a lot going on. So I thought it'd be worth taking a look at what's going on in the economy and what we think some of the risks and opportunities are. Um, so, you know, I, when I looked at the economic activity, I was actually a little surprised that the second quarter was pretty strong. I think it's because they were pulling forward some of the uh, uh, future growth. <clears throat> but you have a lot of things going on right now. So you have the grain deal that um, uh, they are putting the blockages on, which uh, will push up grain prices somewhat. Uh, but Russia is somewhat protected from that because of their uh, ability to target their exports of grain to uh, like-minded uh, uh, partners like China and India. Um, you're seeing the consumer, which has been surprisingly strong year to date, but I'm thinking that's a pull forward of their future spending um, because I don't think that's likely to hold up. Um, but you have big government spending for the, for the war, and that's been a big driver. And you have employment at record levels. So, um, you know, with their other issues going on, uh, people have jobs. That's not the issue. Although there's one job they don't want that Russia is pushing for. That's to have the privilege of serving their military. But the other problem that's hitting Russia right now is that um, their revenues are starting to be impacted by the change in oil prices. And you have inflation starting to rise. And uh, Russia's inflation target is 4%. Um, and they're breaching that right now. Uh, Russia had a hundred basis point increase in their sent by their central bank this month. Likely more to come. So you're getting a slowing economy with rising inflation, not a great setup. Um, and you have that at the same time that they've had to cut their uh, oil production in line with uh, OPEC, and you're seeing a big drop in oil revenues. And then to put it in perspective. Uh, revenues for oil and gas are down 36%, excuse me, year over year through June. Profits are down 31%. And oil is one of the largest uh, sources of revenues for Russia. And those deficits are hitting the current account balance. And you can see it's gone negative. Uh, that's not a great setup for a country that uh, is outflowing capital. The other problem with Russia, and you have to step back and think if this is a business, and you gave up 50% of the market for your largest customer, how do you recover from that? And how long does it take to recover from that? And I think this will be a decades-long problem to uh, try and restore trading relationships and business relationships with the West after uh, the sanctions that have been on. And sanctions usually stay in place for some time, particularly if this ends in a sloppy uh, fashion uh, that is not favorable to the West. Um, you could see this uh, really uh, starting to uh, continue to create problems. This is a, just a chart of Russian seaborne exports before the war, around the EU embargo implementation date and pre before the embargo. On the left-hand side, you can see um, people who are not putting sanctions on. And on the right-hand side, you can see the sanctions and they're almost mirror images of what's going on. So it speaks to how well do the sanctions actually work or not, um, but it also speaks to the way that China and India have played uh, both sides against the middle. And in their in Modi's defense, he's doing exactly what a leader should do: is securing the best price for their energy uh, that they can have, even if it's doing it with people that you don't necessarily want to be partnering with for the long term. So this chart shows the change in Russian imports. Uh, 
by countries and they took 51 of their largest trading partners. And where you see red, that's down more than five percentage points from this January to January period. Where you see green, it's up more than five percentage points. So no surprise given the geopolitical uh, makeup, but it is, a, it is interesting that you are giving up because of the conflict, the, the US, the North American and European markets, as well as parts of uh, Latin America. So that is not a great setup for, for what you're looking at here for what happens to Russia's uh, opportunities going forward. So let me just wrap up and say that I think it's about to get a lot worse for the Russian economy. When a major economy is ejected from the global financial system and cut out of many areas of global trade, the full consequences of that could take years, if not decades, to be manifest. Russian exports have been redirected to Asia, which has helped India and China somewhat, but the sanctions are here to stay. And in Russia's case, as I mentioned, it could take decades before they, they get removed. And during that time, the sanctions are whittling away at access to certain types of materials. And it might not, ha it's happening gradually, but when you start to see a rundown of the ability to maintain old equipment, you're getting put in a spot where you could see a, just a steady decay of the system. And when money's being pushed to two areas, one being funding the war and two being to higher inflation, that actually is a choking off of productive spend and I think is putting Russia in a very difficult spot. In addition to that, we've had the tragic loss of lives of so many young people, and whether it's 100,000 or 200,000, those numbers are staggering and the impact will be felt for some time. In addition to that, you have a massive brain drain that's going on and hundreds of thousands of people are moving. And we talked about earlier, Mark, you mentioned the movement to Dubai was 1.25 million people. That's over, you know, just shy of 1% of the population that's shifting over there. That's way too much to leave. And who's who leaves first? It's the skilled professionals that go first. And what you're left with is the people who are struggling financially to begin with, typically, or the true believers. I think what you're seeing is they're leaving to for fear of the draft, fear of future border closures. So I think Russia's future really is dependent on the duration and outcome of the war, what it means for President Putin and how how long this goes on and how really the sanctions cut deep into the industrial base. And then when you lose so many of the markets and so many of the professionals that can drive those markets, you're gutting out the, the real strength that was uh, the old USSR and the Russian Federation, their best strengths are being carved out. And I think that um, this war was a huge mistake as we know, but it'll, the mistake will be felt <clears throat> excuse me, for some time. I think the Russian people will be suffering for quite some time as a result. So Mark, I'm going to stop there and we can open up for comments and discussion. Thanks, Stephen. Stephen. Comments? Yep. Uh, Stephen, excellent presentation at, at, the, at the high level. In, in um, terms of the impact to Russia, it's more than dec decades. This is going to be generations to recover from. Generations to recover from the brain drain, from the technology that um, they've lost. I remember back in the 90s, um, walking through many of the machine tool factories and the technology in those factories where they were already a generation behind, two generations behind. This, is, this has destroyed Russia and Ukraine. Now, my belief is Ukraine will certainly recover a lot faster than Russia will. It will take a long time for this to, 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 to recover. That's it's not a question. That's just my comment on it. I also believe, that, Adam, to add to that, that uh, it wouldn't surprise me if the West ends up putting a significant bill for the rebuild of Russia, believe it or not. That, that is going to be dependent on the the who takes over in Russia. Yep. There there is a very very good article which I'll post in the chat here. Um, that was written by Maria Signovia from the uh, Atlantic Council about 
did Russia ever have a chance at democracy? Very, very interesting piece. Basically saying, in short, there is no difference between Russia of the 90s and the Soviet Union in that you had the same leadership taking over most functions of government. So you had that Soviet mentality, that nomenclatura that just took over. And they never really had an opportunity. I'll post it in the chat. Very, very good piece. And it's applicable yeah. not only to Russia, but also to other, um, other countries that go through these kinds of transitions. Hey, Adam, before I forget, I, I want to get Bill Browder. Uh, we talked about it. He's got a new book and everything. So I was curious to get his commentary. Uh, Bill Deichler. You had your hand up first. Sure. No. Yeah. Very thought provoking to say the least, Stephen and, and and Adam. Great, great color commentary on that. You know, I I, I wonder. You know, it it begs back to World War II, and you know, in, in two two ways, what you just said with regard to rebuilding, um, the sort of the, the enemies were were pretty much destroyed in World War II. So the vestiges of their governmental systems were gone. And so, you know, the Marshall Plan made a lot of sense. I'm not I'm 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 not so sure that if if the government isn't significantly changed in Russia that that we would be so willing to do that. Although from an economic standpoint it might might be a good thing. But your earlier figures on oil in particular and the decline in revenues just immediately brought back sort of pre-World War II Japan situation. And maybe that's more of a, um, of a Hamlet question, but, but uh, any, any thoughts on that or are Russian emigres, any thoughts on that one at all? I think they're, I think they're in a, I think you, they're in a really tough spot. Their their number one source of revenue is the thing everyone's moving away from. <laughs> so just start with that and say, what's the future look like when your best asset is one that's depleting in terms of its use around the world? And then your second, but maybe your maybe that's your second best asset. Maybe your best asset, which was your people, you're also losing at, a, at an alarming rate. So it doesn't bode well for the future at all. <laughs> and it's really... And but in the short term, along with their third asset, which is food, yep, um, yep. with with what they've done, um, you know, of of late, that they're benefiting um, in the, the short in the term. short term. But Mark, the question on the food one is: they're benefiting and they're hurting other of their allies in the process, which is most of Africa and the Middle East. Yep. So. How long do they get the short? Is it a pyrrhic victory? Do they get a short-term gain and turn other former allies against them because they're starving them? Um, it's a really tough problem. Well, there's. And let me add Walter, to that. Walter, 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 I just well, let's let's the hand hands are important. So, mm -hmm. Walter, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for your presentation, Stephen. Um, you know, we see and we read in the paper about how the Ukrainian offensive has um, stalled because of the lack of proper munitions or the amount of munitions. And we also read about how even the European and, and the U.S. are having difficulty in ramping up the munitions to support them. I'm wondering what the situation is inside Russia. I mean, they've been blasting Ukraine for years now. <laughs> and um, I wonder what their munition situation is like, if they have the proper materials, if they have the manpower, their factories, or, you know, your thoughts on that? It's, it's equal. They're, we're all running out of munitions and they're borrowing from Iran quite heavily. Um, and they say they're not borrowing from China or China says they're not helping them, but um, they're, they have to be getting close to the point where they're running low as well. And uh, that rebuild will be more of a challenge as longer longer this goes on. So I think it is a problem for both sides right now. Uh, Stephen, do you want to add a, uh, Stephen Keith? Yeah, I've had issues with that, that these hands. Are, I, I do have a question um, 
What do you, uh, Stephen? Do you think there's there are uh, negative um, impacts upon India, short term and long term, from them lining up so solidly behind Russia? I think the uh, I think the U.S. and China are putting the rest of the world in a very difficult spot, where they're going to have to either decide they're going to partner with one or the other, or partner with both, and take those benefits as they come. Um, Modi's doing what a leader is supposed to do is do the best he can for his own country. It gets questionable when Russia has been so negatively aggressive, but I think the economic challenges that India is facing require them to do the best they can to get secure supplies of energy at the best price. So it's hard to say whether that's going to hurt them too much or not. I doubt it will, um, because they're also the most attractive other big growing market for consumers And they represent the hope of maybe the next China for end markets for people. So I think that uh, it'll hurt them a little bit, but not particularly too badly because of that. Well, we're as their uh, own problems that they got to deal with too. <laughs> so that's another deep dive we're going to do is is on India. I don't know. De Depender and I were just chatting. We're picking up uh, with the macro fund. A, uh, and a, some venture funds. I think they're definitely benefiting by low energy costs and the and the vacuum of the transfer of capital from China, and then all the other demographic um, issues. Anyone else comments? I'll, I'll just make a comment on that, which is parallel to India. Brazil has actually benefited from this. You know, the the, the rail has strengthened over the last several months. Um, you know, they've got the um, They're, they're, they're going to benefit from the grain embargo. Uh, Brazil is self-sufficient in terms of energy, basically, in terms of oil, and, and they've got ethanol. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see. So Lula has been able to dance this pretty well. I'm not a fan of Lula, but he's, he's actually done a good thing for, for Brazil. Fair enough. Saren? Um, I wanted to ask, like, what, what do you think about the position of NATO or like the global view of uh, NATO before and after, um, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, the basically the Russian-Ukraine crisis, how, how that impacted the global positioning of U.S. maybe? I think, you know, NATO is, uh, the NATO nations were hanging on U.S. spending and, uh, not meeting their own targets for way too long. And the war in Europe was a wake up call for them to get their spending up to, to reasonable levels. <clears throat> and now they're starting to do it very aggressively and realizing how far they have to catch up. And they're in the process of doing that. So we see more spending coming, but it's probably in some cases, uh, they need to do a lot more than they, than they even think they do to get, uh, to get, Competent well, in their material, in and their... they just had they just had that meeting last weekend, right? Yep. Um, where they effectively come together stronger, doubling down, um, and yeah, taking more European leadership. I think it helps yeah. now. Now you have Finland and Sweden. I think they are, uh, but they, you know the best the the biggest nation in in Europe has the the probably the worst military. Uh, position right now because of the years of neglect. So it's really going to take a, a concerted effort. How it benefits the U.S. is it will US benefit the U.S. defense companies as they're among the biggest suppliers, not only to our own defense industry, but to all the NATO nations as well. So as that spending yeah. goes up, it's going to be material and uh, those benefits will transfer over to- How has your defense companies. weighting uh, changed over the last couple of years, Stephen? We've held it pretty around the, around the same level. So we've been probably 9% to 14% weighted in defense, um, which has been mixed. It's actually uh, had mixed performance because uh, it usually takes off at the start of a war and then takes off after. But in the middle, it kind of gets a little slack, and we're seeing that right now. Got it. Jerry? Hi. First of all, Stephen, thank you so much. Um, How do you see this ending? 20% of Ukraine is occupied and the Russians are no longer offensive. They're just digging in. Ukraine has hit basically a quagmire here. They can't really 
uh, unroot the the Russians. I'm, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Fifty percent of the Russian military has been either wiped out or severely damaged. We're way out of artillery shells that are very crucial for our army and so on. And this might take five to seven years to kind of get our supply back to where we're comfortable. How does this end? And I, and I don't see any. Are there any negotiations going on at all? And you know, wh where does this end? Because now we're near 14, 15 months and we're definitely starting to hear the moans of an extended uh, engagement here. Um, what do you think? I, I think it's really hard to, it's really hard to know uh, when it ends or how it ends because uh, when you have uh, the, the will of the West to stay together, which um, seems to be ebbing and flowing, but right now it seems to be on a more positive movement with uh, the changes in NATO. Um, but I think it's going to drag on for some time. I think Russia, for all their mistakes that they've made, I think their defense is probably going to be better than their offense here. And I think they've the way they've mined um, so much of Ukraine right now, where they're trying to defend, uh, is going to make it really difficult to um, for the advances to be as successful as they'd hope, which means it's going to drag on for a lot longer and then the will starts to fade. Um, so I don't know what it's going to take to push people to uh, the negotiating table. What I do worry is that um, the economics of the war and the rundown of materials or the fear of Putin from losing his uh, status will push him to do something uh, uh, too radical that will create a black swan event. And that's actually the worry that I have around that. So I think it's going to drag on longer and be more costly and really test the will of the West to stay together. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't know who's up next, Michael or Andrew. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so one of the interesting things not mentioned in today's discussion in your presentation, Stephen, is the recent change in tactics by Russia since the recent attack on the Kerch Bridge. So instead of just dropping out of the grain agreement, they're attacking the uh, port infrastructure, the grain storage, um, which implies that even if in at some point in the future, agreement on resumption of grain exports by Ukraine is reached, they may not be able to do so, or at least not at the level that they have been. Yeah, I think they're destroying massive amounts of the infrastructure of both nations around that area right now. So I I think you're right. They're creating big long-term problems. And and they're creating it for a lot of people that, um, like the West has food issues, but not nowhere near the degree of a lot of Russians' allies. So they're actually hurting their supporters. And I think that's going to be a really interesting thing to see play out. Um so it's it's a sloppy it's a really sloppy situation, which is probably why we don't talk about it as much. <laughs> um, Andrew, Andrew, um, you know a lot of the headlines for a long time have been about not attacking over the border in Russia. Um, a couple of military sites have been hit and didn't seem to raise much uh, right. of anyone's hairs. And and the headlines are about Russia escalating, uh, other than using a nuclear weapon i can't even imagine what that would even look like i think and and i want anyone's opinion i think what people are really worried about is dragging the chinas or other people more into it than just uh sending uh commercial drones through maldives or whatever they've been doing lately um is you think that's a, a correct assessment and will it change uh steven if or anybody else an interesting uh, view, and I think you could make the case for it. I think the one issue that um, is in the back of my mind is China's economy is not in a state where um, they want to get dragged in to do that too when they're dealing with their domestic problems. So I think the Chinese economy is going to play a, a role in how they progress and social stability there 
into how far they'd be willing to allow Russia to escalate and, and engage China support in that. On the other hand, if it's really bad, general people generally find wars to be good for their economy after the fact. So maybe that will push them. But my sense is that China's too too fragile right now and where they are to want to get pushed into a, a war that they don't want to be involved in. So Stephen, my my thing was to Jerry's comment was if you want to move the ball from a stalemate, uh, you take out Russia's supply lines uh, inside Russia uh, behind the Ukrainian border seems to be the one thing that hasn't really been done uh, to any degree that everybody from a headline perspective is afraid of, but would probably, I'm not a military guy, but would probably make a difference um, if anybody's got a view on it. So you well, even, even protecting the skies uh, for the, you know, that's what they've been calling for. Uh, but yeah, it, it, that doesn't change the stalemate too much. Uh, it doesn't, there's, they're dug in. But sorry, go ahead, Michael, if you want to comment. I was going to say, uh, responding to... I can't hear you. Um, Still can't hear you. Uh, no. No? There no. you go. Okay. Um, so responding to your question, Andrew... Uh, Ukraine has been hitting uh, supply depots uh, behind uh, the Russian front lines and, be and over the border. Um, I think it's more uh, a lack of capability on their part to do more than anything else as to why you haven't seen more of that. But I think one of the wild cards um, is... Russia's recent announcement that they will consider any vessels in the Black Sea, civilian vessels approaching Ukraine to be carrying military supplies and subject to attack. So, for example, what happens if a Turkish vessel is hit? How will Erdogan and the Turks respond? And, and I can tell you, based on the years that I lived in Turkey, um, they are fiercely nationalistic in some sort of response. I don't know what would be called for. Um, but also, what if they hit a vessel from a third country? What if it's a member of NATO? Does that uh, mean that Article 5 gets invoked? Um, so there's all sorts of things percolating out there. Uh, and, and as Stephen mentioned in his presentation, it's the Black Swan events. This is almost like the lead up uh, in what happened in World War I, where, you know, things just developed and there was no real way to stop it because of all the relationships among the different parties. Yep. I think that's a great point. I think that one big risk right now with, with how this war evolves is the black swan, that that they go too far on it, you know, bombing near a nuclear facility, that they take out a, a, a plane or a ship that's not a Ukrainian one. Those are all the issues that you can see really escalating. Does it drag the bigger powers in or not? I'm not sure the answer to that, but it's, uh, it is what's uh, keeping a lot of people up at night. Other comments, questions? Uh, just to add to that, uh, Mark, you pointed out um, uh, basically putting F-16s with long-range missiles is, I suppose, going to take out Russian planes on the other side of the border. And yes, there's been some small-scale uh, attacks, Michael, but I think wasn't that why we didn't give them attackums and longer-range missiles because we didn't want them to actually land in Russia? Well, they already are landing in Russia. Um, you know, what is? Uh, missiles, drone attacks. Um, so the question is, is it a qualitative issue? Is it a quantitative issue? Is it a distance issue? I mean, uh, Ukrainian drones have 
hit Moscow. Not at any great scale, but, you know, the question then becomes, will the U.S. drop support or reduce support? Will NATO reduce support? I don't think so. Um, in some respects, this is a proxy war. Um, and I don't mean that pejoratively. I mean that as while the West, U.S. and NATO, don't want to see their own troops engaged or directly engage Russia, I don't think they're particularly upset at what Ukraine is doing. There's what's for public consumption, and then there's what is actually going on behind the scenes. Yeah, I, I think you said quantity, and that's where I was going, not a little drone you know, attacking a building, but uh, literally taking out Russian air bases within 100 miles of the Ukrainian border proactively and en and, and masse. And that, that's not happening, so. Yeah, I, I, I do think, Andrew, one of the elements is uh, they, Ukraine has a sympathy factor as they're the victims here. As you start going in and killing citizens of other countries in their own land, it changes the calculus for everyone. And I think that is part of the, yeah. the issue that is really a thin line that they're going to have to sort through is how do they manage through that? Yeah. Um, Stephen, that's exactly where I started the question. You're absolutely right. That's exactly what the question I started with. Yes. You know, it's a PR issue too, which is ironic when you're talking about war, but it's a factor. You mentioned, but it seems stuff. like just, well, it seems like just hitting military bases, nobody, uh, you know, as Michael pointed out, nobody, nobody thought about that. I think hitting apartment buildings in Moscow is probably counterproductive to the point yep. Stephen just made. How many troops are on the ground from Russia in the Ukraine? Do, does anybody know that? There's 100,000 in Donbass plus everything else. I don't have the number. Adam, Adam, I mean, if, you, if, you took, if you took the nuclear thing off the table, right? I mean, this thing could end very quickly <laughs> if there was just a will to give Ukraine enough stuff to end it quickly, whether it's planes or whatever. I mean, you just bring the planes in, go in there, just blow up 100,000 troops. I mean, this could be done in four days, just like the Iraq war. I mean, it just, it, it feels like to me, I, I don't know what people think here, but it, you know, it feels like there's this, this whole thing has been so predictable from a year ago. I mean, everything Stephen outlined is all things we kind of could see happening literally two months after the war started. And it's all kind of unfolded exactly as you had expected, maybe with the exception that NATO has worked better together than we might have thought. And so, you know, just like all the markets do this slow moving, you know, we've had this slow moving recession. We can see the Fed raising rates. We haven't seen all the effects yet. feels like the same thing's going on here. And the longer Putin threatens nuclear and doesn't do it, and the longer the Chinese tell him you can't do nuclear, the more he's kind of running out of options. And, you know, at some level, you just keep upping the pressure, incrementally doing a little more, a little more. He doesn't get the message. That's what I don't understand. Is well, he should be looking for an exit strategy right now. And why won't he look for an exit strategy? I mean, it's just the, it's Duncan and I, I Duncan, I need to jump in here and, and follow up with what you just said. Yeah. And that goes what you just said goes to the heart of the problem. And that is you've got one man making the the, the decisions. He's living in another world. Okay. We saw this happening. He is, he's disconnected with reality. You talk about the number of troops on, on the border. That's, that's a 1500 mile, 1500 kilometer front. The Ukrainians have 11 battalions that are probing that. Only four of those battalions have been deployed. They break through that line. That entire line collapses because it's very, very thin. Okay. That will be the domino that collapses the, 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 the entire regime. 
You've got so many variables coming to a head right now. Everything's going to depend on the success or failure of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. If it is a success, even, <clears throat> even 50%, a marginal success, Putin has to do a mobilization. If you notice, just recently they raised the age of conscription. Okay. Why? We need to get troops. People are leaving the country. So as these body bags come back from the front, you have a mobilization of young kids coming. Again, the mothers are going to, to they, they are already protesting. You're getting pockets of protests in Dagestan and other parts in the regions. That is going to come to a head. The Ministry of Defense is the one being thrown under the bus. So you've got Shaigu, you've got Garisimov. They're not happy. They're generals. And their kids are their their soldiers are being killed. Yeah. This will come to a head. I again do not believe Putin lasts past 2023. Uh, I, would just, I would just add, Duncan, I think Putin has looked at his options. None of them are any good. And if he doesn't win, if he doesn't win outright, he's done. So that's why he's playing this as long as he can, because he's hoping to break the will of the West. That's exactly right. He is so trying to break the West. Do you think he's trying to play into our election cycle, thinking that the, the, the next election could, I mean, obviously it's going to come up as an issue for debate. And I, I think he wants to get, he'd like to see the next election cycle. I don't right. think he cares about the election cycle. I think he wants to make sure he gets there in power. Right. But, well, that's, Adam. Part, that's part of wearing out the West. Yeah, yeah, part of the strategy. Adam, you yeah. mentioned. I, I want to mention regarding the grains. Look at the flags of the cargo ships that are coming in and out of those three Ukrainian ports. Those are friendly flag countries. The likelihood that he, a lot of Putin is bluff, bluff, bluff. Exactly. Including the nuclear option. Okay. It's all bluff. He's not going to take out one of those cargo ships. That would be very, very, that collapses. I don't see it happening. So, Adam, Adam, they just, they just mined and fired up one of the reactors in Ukraine. Well, that was, that was running cold. Uh, yeah, that's right. It reminds me of, of Sodom leaving Kuwait and just blowing everything up on the way out the door. Uh, I, I'm just imagining that's one of the fears that's out there. That that is a black swan that I that I see as a possibility. That being the nuclear reactor being sabotaged and creating that creating that diversion. I can see it's that more than that. It's other critical infrastructure like the dam. If they keep knocking out elements of the grid, you're slowly chipping away at at the ability for them to put up a defense. Too. So I think that you're going to see more, more of those chipping aways. Um, Mark, I have to jump. So thank you guys. Yeah, yeah. You well, why don't you tell, tell people what you're going to talk about today at 12 and then tomorrow uh, at 12. Well, we're going to focus on how efforts around decarbonization, deglobalization, and remilitarization are shaping the uh, what we see as a new economic and geopolitical era and uh, where we see the opportunities and uh and we are going to talk a little bit about one of the challenges around uh, the climate transition, three of the challenges around the climate transition uh, that are uh, creating some delays and in increasing the cost. And then we'll touch on a little bit about, uh, and you saw it today with uh, the German uh, IFO numbers uh, really hitting record low levels and how this uh, reindustrialization is really taking hold now and starting to take off. So we'll touch on uh, those couple areas and where we see opportunities going forward. So this is, Thanks, uh, yeah, yeah, thank thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Bye-bye. So, Thanks, so just, Adam. Just so you know, I'll just put in the link. Uh, you guys can see the outlooks that, uh, that they do. And today, uh, you could either listen today if it's more of a webinar, whereas tomorrow 
it's going to be an inter- in the same thing, but interactive 361 style, plus at ARS's offices for lunch, plus Zoom. And um, but the point we will be asking everyone to participate is to think about how you see the implications for this, you know, reindustrialization by countries, industries, and companies. So hope hope you can you can join. And uh, otherwise, thank you. And tomorrow, 1030, um, invite people that you think could be interesting speakers on some of the subjects we talked about, whether it's the ener- energy meets uh, utility grid meets data um, from Andrew, though he just jumped to go to that, uh, that webinar. Uh, or anything else you guys want to talk about. And Paul, I, I was hoping, Manjo, you were going to talk about some of the things we, we spoke about yesterday, speaking of black swans. But, uh, conflict, I couldn't uh, participate in much of the just, call just, today. Just, just, just to throw it out, pa- Paul's view, can I share it? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Is it we're going to go up and then go far down? Uh, and one of the triggers he thinks is the is the, um, the, the, the student debt um, payments and the you know the draw on cash from the consumer. That's probably a, a very simplified view, but also in a. And then we said there are some bowls out there like uh, Edward Yardeni. Let's get the bowls and the bears together and have a discussion. Do you want to elaborate on that? I mean, I think it's also about commercial banks. So I think there's commercial banks trying to pull up. There was an article yesterday about uh, the FDIC or the Fed gave commercial banks the ability to modify or, you know, be more conservative or or more forgiving in terms of their uh, recovery on on loans. uh, And they can do modifications even in the cases where the loan the the, the property values are way be, you know or below the the loan balance like not talking about uh you know principal forgiveness but just being uh s- slow down on collection so you know it was it was in the journal yesterday so i think the, i think there's a lot of issues around uh you know commercial property values and and uh and small banks that have a lot of assets on. So I think that's there's there's multiple things that are going to add up to, to the trigger, I, I believe. And also the shipping issue. There was, a, there was an issue with these uh, the LTL trucking. Uh, one of the companies called Yellow was about to have a strike and they really hadn't because they hadn't made paid a, uh, a large pension payment for their drivers and so they just you know i think they delayed it a few maybe a week or two but uh you know the the the, the, the issue is that the, the company was not profitable because of you know lack of uh business uh so i you know i, I think there's you know I'll, I'll try to pull up more data around you know these specific issues but there's, there's a lot of small things that i think michael do you want to add something uh, yeah, actually, I was going to take Adam up on his wager, but he bounced, so oh, I'll leave that. It, but the other the thing, 20, that, the twenty twenty three, I, I, I yeah. would take, I would take the the other side. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyways, uh, we haven't mentioned the potential UPS strike is an issue. Yeah, yeah, that's and that's like. What used to be a lot of Amazon, yeah, but that's that that's definitely an issue. I mean, I think that's. I'm surprised, like it hasn't really hit the mainstream news as much, uh, because that's an issue where you know, you have a, you know, the executive you know, administration, like they come in, they sit down with the union, they sit down with the company, that they, they they work it out, and there's been very little of that so far, at least that we've seen publicly. Yeah, I was listening to the Secretary of Labor, or I guess the interim Secretary of Labor. She she sounded like she was part of the union. And I'm a moderate, but she sounded like she was part of the union. Uh, that's not probably what brings people to the table. Um, well, look, I'll let you uh, let you all go on to your days. 
Thank you. Uh, Paul, will to be continued on all these fronts. Depender, invite your friend from India tomorrow, 1030. We'll explore, uh, get, get a bunch of these deep dives going while we can. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you all.